Hi, and welcome to the Mayor's Report. I'm Northampton Mayor David Narkowitz, and this is my monthly program on Northampton Community Television, where we talk about the issues and projects that are happening here in the city. Today, I'm really pleased to be joined by our Superintendent of Schools, John Provost. And John, uh, Superintendent Provost, has been working on a uh, very important project as part of his new superintendency here in the district, and those are his entry findings. So we're really excited to have him on today uh, to talk a little bit about his findings, um, how he came up with them, and where we go from here. Welcome, Superintendent Provost. Thank you, Mayor. It's great to be here. Great to have you. Before we get started, um, why don't you just give folks at home a little bit about your background as an educator and, and what brought you, how, where you've been before you came here to Northampton? Sure. Um, I began my career in public education about 25 years ago in Northampton in an outfit known as the Hampshire Educational Collaborative, mm. which is now the Collaborative for Educational Services. Exactly. Um, at the time, I was a paraprofessional working in a behavior program um, in Amherst. It's called the uh, Hampshire Alternative Learning Program. Um, and I've sort of worked my way from paraprofessional all the way through the ranks of teaching in central office and to the superintendency. Mm -hmm. And it's great to be back here in Northampton again. Exactly, exactly. So talk to us a little bit about, um, about this process that we call entry findings in, 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 your, in your field. Sure. So um, when a new superintendent enters a district, it's really important to get the lay of the land. Um, one of the things that happens uh, frequently for superintendents is um, the first people who come to talk to you may be people who are really highly motivated by certain issues. Um, and you can become sort of clouded by um, just paying attention to those voices that you're hearing if you don't take the time to study the district from multiple perspectives. So the recommendation is for superintendents to do a several month real autopsy, if you will, of the district um, that includes talking to as many people as possible in as many different forums as possible, um, looking at as many documents as possible, and then trying to identify what are sort of the overarching themes that cut across buildings and cut across districts so that you can identify the real key issues where you want to place your bets in the next several years. Mm -hmm. And so how many, just roughly, how many various like interviews, forums, et cetera, did you do as part of this, uh, as part of creating this process, this document? So in the months of July and August and early September, we had, um, several score of interviews with people. I think we met with over 90 people altogether, mm -hmm. and I think uh, approximately 40 to 45 of them felt comfortable going on the record with interviews. Mm -hmm. um, that was followed up by parent nights at both Jackson Street and JFK, um, at which we sort of used the same questions, but we dialogued in a focus group kind of format instead of individual interviews. Mm -hmm. And um, the process of document review has been ongoing from the beginning. Um, so I've been collecting documents out of the archives going back several years to try to get a picture of what's been happening in the district. And um, in my office, there's a great big box that has all the documents that kind of get reduced to this 60-page mm -hmm. report. Mm -hmm. Which you've presented to the school committee, and now we're... Uh and now becomes the process of everyone having a chance to digest it and, and then figure out what the next steps are. So tell us a little bit about what, what some, of your, you know, some of your key findings were. What are the, sort of the things that the themes that you that came through and some of the data that how the data revealed itself to you about our district? Sure. So like most districts, I found that Northampton has um, a lot of great strengths mm -hmm. and it has some challenges ahead. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of strengths, things that I'd like to point out are the district's foreign language program. Um, thinking back to the last time data was collected on foreign languages, which was in 2002, there were only 60 districts in Massachusetts that reported any kind of foreign language offering below seventh grade. Mm -hmm. um, so that puts Northampton in a very sort of elite class. With, because with, of our world language program at the middle school. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, also, the arts program uh, is quite amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Northampton High School has, is the only high school I've been in with three theaters, mm -hmm. and I've been in a lot of high schools. In fact, um, the college where I did my undergraduate work only had two theaters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that speaks uh, really to Northampton's commitment to the arts. 
Um, the AP program at the high school, I think, is remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I talked about was AP is community. advanced placement, just yes. for people who may not Sorry. understand that jargon. Yeah. Um, one of the things I talked with the school committee about was a very nice email that I had gotten from another superintendent um, who was analyzing her own um, advanced placement program and said when she was trying to benchmark across other districts that Northampton really stood out to her and mm -hmm. so she wanted me to know about that. Mm -hmm. um, and so then there are also some challenges um, mm -hmm. facing Northampton. I think one of the things that um, really became clear to me is that there's a large demographic shift taking place that I think um, really needs to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I was um, one of the things that I think surprised me was when I started looking at two groups of students in particular. There's um, what the Department of Education calls high needs students, okay. who are students that are either low income, students with disability, or English language learners. And then there's non high needs students who are basically everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that over the past five years or so, the number of high need students enrolled by Northampton and the proportion of high need students enrolled by Northampton has been increasing. Mm -hmm. And likewise, the number of non-high need students has been decreasing. Um, and you looked a little bit, or you, you, um, you do present some potential reasons for why that might happen, or do you have any theories about what, what's driving that? Or I, I think that the main driver is low income status students. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, it's been a very slow, almost imperceptible recovery exactly. from the recession. Mm -hmm. And so I think that many families who are sort of on the margin are falling below the threshold to be uh, classified as high needs or, or low income families. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, you know, one of the things that um, I think concerns me as a superintendent is we need, we've shown that that group of students in particular we're not as effective with mm -hmm. as we are with the the, the students who are not high needs. Mm -hmm. and so as that's making an ever larger proportion of our enrollment, um, it, it's becoming ever more important that we figure out how to be more effective with them. Especially when we get to things like MCAS testing and, mm -hmm. and all the other measures that we're now required to, to give students. So, okay. Yes. Other, other findings? So um, Northampton is, due to its, its override and recent spending plan sort of stabilizing from a period of economic trouble. Mm -hmm. There were a number of programs that were cut mm -hmm. during those, those years. Um, we can see that when we compare Northampton's education spending compared to other districts in the area and other districts across the state, that in that pre-override era, we really lost a lot of ground. Yeah, um, we, it's, I know, remember reading, we were essentially flat and the rest of the state had gone up 7% during right. that three-year period. Right. Yeah. So um, I think the good news is that the override certainly helps us to stabilize our finances, mm -hmm. but um, the bad news is we have a lot of ground to make up and mm -hmm. we have to think about how we can use our resources wisely to try to restore or bring back other programs to replace the ones that were cut. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other other things that that come through in your in your analysis. I know it, when I read through it, um, you spend a lot of time talking about the differences in at the different grade levels and even in the different school communities as well. Mm -hmm. That there's some. It's not you can't describe Northampton. Um, and you even talk about that there's a there's different perceptions of our district, but but there are some some differences between the different grade levels and even within the different schools themselves. Sure. So um, to go back to my discussion of high need students and low income students, I was describing the district as a whole, mm -hmm. um, but that can be a little bit misleading um, because what you really have are the K to eight schools. Mm -hmm. um, experiencing large increases in their high need students mm -hmm. and the high school experiencing some increases but mm -hmm. really serving a remarkably different um, population. Mm -hmm. um, so just to give you some some idea of what I'm talking about, most of the grades at the high school level have about 20 to 30 percent of their students who we'd call high needs. Mm -hmm. We've got um, grades at the middle school or the elementaries that are 
fifty percent or more mm -hmm. high needs. Um, so it's really two different populations. And I think one of the things that drives that is there are um, some families who bypass the elementary. There mm -hmm. are some families who even bypass the middle school mm -hmm. and enter the high school or enter the public school system only at the ninth grade level. Mm -hmm. um, those families tend to fit a different demographic profile from the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so their and absence... And they're attending <laughs> schools that don't have the same mix of diversity. low income and diversity and high needs. Right. Yeah. So their absence in grades K through 8 tend to um, make our proportion of students who have high needs there higher. Mm -hmm. And then their entry at ninth grade tends to um, dampen down um, mm -hmm. the the proportion that's that's high need students you know because you found 21 I think you said about 21 percent of ninth graders are coming into the system for the first time so right. there's a whole group that are coming to the high school and getting into the system at ninth grade that's almost a quarter of the of the class so right. yeah and they're not like the you know it's not just a representative um, sampling of the population mm -hmm. it's it's families that tend to not be high needs mm -hmm. okay so other other uh, other findings. I know special education uh, spending uh, and just service level and service delivery was one of the other things you focused on in the report. Yes, um, and in fact, that's something that's been in the documents about Northampton for at least half a decade. Mm -hmm. um, the I, I think there are a couple of a couple of drivers there. One is that um, Northampton identifies a very high percentage percentage of its students is having disabilities. Mm -hmm. And that's even when you um, say, let compare it to representative or, or similar districts rather than the state as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't, I haven't figured out what drives that, but that certainly I think will be one of the next pieces of the work. But that sets off a whole cascade of problems. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're over identifying students with disabilities, it means that you're targeting them to programs that typically are um, different than the programs that the mainstream students are getting, which creates an equity issue mm -hmm. in and of itself, mm -hmm. but it also adds to the overall cost of educating those students. Because you um, need additional staff and you, in, 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 uh, yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Which then, you know, limits resources that could be spent in the other parts of the program. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at the type of special education that we're providing in Northampton for those students, even if you set aside the issue of whether we're identifying the right kids, um, one of the things that was surprising to me is that um, the Northampton um, schools are not as inclusive as you would expect them to be. Hmm. Um, for, there's uh, a target that the state sets for districts around full inclusion. Mm -hmm. What full inclusion is defined as a student with a disability who spends 80% or more of their time in the general education setting. Mm -hmm. And the goal there is that 80% of your students with disabilities should be in the regular ed setting 80% mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. Right now, Northampton's inclusion rate is 53%. Hmm. Um, so that's very low, yeah. and, and especially in comparison to the surrounding towns. And that also um, contributes to the financial issue because um, typically, it is less costly and more effective to teach most students with disabilities in an inclusive setting. Mm -hmm. If you're over-identifying and then also setting up a model that is highly restrictive, um, not only are you sort of limiting access to the general education curriculum to those kids, but you're also creating a system that is more costly to run. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other issues that, uh, that came through in your findings, I know you touched on um, well, the funding issue, which we talked about before, which has its own, there's ramifications at all levels of government mm -hmm. that drive that. Um, I know you talked a little bit about athletics. You talked mm -hmm. about a number of things. Are there other key things that, that jumped out at you through this process? I think um, the transitions, not only of leadership, but transitions of teachers mm -hmm. um, was an important finding for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had known as a candidate that there had been a lot of transitions at mm -hmm. the superintendent level mm -hmm. in Northampton. One of the things that um, became more and more clear to me as I began looking at personnel records was how many transitions there had been at the principal level yes. and at, even at the teacher level in certain buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of those things are disruptive to a system. Um, they all tend to sort of 
with you know hold down the progress that a system is able to make. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I'm hoping to do is to bring some stability and some continuity so that um, processes can can move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, another finding which could very well be related to some of those transitions is um, the status of our curriculum, mm -hmm. especially at the uh, K to eight level. Mm -hmm. um, we one of the things I found was that um, in many cases the curriculum documents didn't exist mm -hmm. um, and in some cases the curriculum documents that did exist were not aligned to the current versions of the state frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, of course, no, Northampton had already figured that out um, and had identified curriculum work as one of the initiatives for this year and a lot of work has been done with that mm -hmm. and we've had over 400 new curriculum units created since the beginning of the year mm -hmm. so I think we have a good handle on that mm -hmm. um, and I think that that bodes well for the future um, because if Northampton has been able to achieve the status that it has without providing teachers the curriculum documents that would really help to guide their work mm -hmm. I just imagine what we're going to be able to do when we have a really solid curriculum in place exactly and I know one of the things one of the findings you mentioned was just was just having a point person that's really focused on that issue I know you mentioned in the report that during some of those years of budget cuts and state cuts and and uh, that that some of the central office staff had been eliminated particularly that director of of curriculum and uh, that went vacant for a couple of years so now we have that position finally filled and and so that person's helping to lead in a lot of those areas yeah and the, the position has been focused um, mm -hmm. better well I think one of the um, prior audits of the district that had been done it said that that person's predecessor had had so many other central office positions collapsed into that mm -hmm. one job description yeah that I think there was something like 13 different positions yeah. that yeah. were residing within that one person yeah um, but we've really been able to free up our curriculum mm -hmm. director to work on curriculum mm -hmm. uh, mainly and so I think that you know just providing the opportunity for a realistic scope of or span of authority um, will allow that position to be more effective yeah I mean I think part of what we're talking about too and you could probably speak to this having you know been in education for 25 years just the the, 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 the changes in how teachers have to do their jobs and, and it's not just here here's a classroom go in there and do that Every, with all of the testing and the shared curriculum and the state curriculum and all of the other matrix or metrics that you're that you're constantly having to measure against you really have to have a very focused and organized approach then you throw in testing mm -hmm. um, and so so t talk about that, how that's changed, and why, why it's important that we do have someone that's focused on you know, professional development and focused on differentiated instruction and focused on all of these techniques which are, which are critical to giving teachers the tools they need to, to educate students. Sure. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen um, across, across the state and across the nation in an effort to provide greater equity for students, mm -hmm. well, it has been standard setting. Yeah, um, you know, I know that it's been somewhat controversial. Um, people have have sort of decried the loss of local control and decried, you know, one size fits all approaches. But the the reality is that prior to that, sort of when I had, was just getting into this business, um, the types of curriculum that were taught in different schools even within the same district, never mind from district to district, mm -hmm. varied greatly. Mm -hmm. And typically it was the most at-risk students who got um, the least effective curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the major efforts across uh, the state and country have been to say, okay, we're going to set a minimum threshold of curriculum that you need to provide for all kids. Mm -hmm. And um, coming, up to, coming up to par with that has really been the work of two decades mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because it Curriculum work is slow, it's tedious. Um, in many cases, it's asking teachers who've developed lesson plans and unit plans that have worked well for a number of years to try to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that process has been ongoing here. And I think um, it's been accelerated since Race to the Top and since Massachusetts waver from Race to the Top. And that 
sort of all coincided with the time when Northampton was cutting programs and going through transitions of leadership. So it allowed sort of the gap between Northampton and what you might consider to be the typical level of work happening around these issues in a district to grow. So now we're sort of um, in the process of catching up. Mm -hmm. I think we're catching up quickly, mm -hmm. um, but we need to sort of keep our foot on the accelerator with that. Exactly. So now that you've... Um now that you've you know completed your findings, what's the next step? What, how do you how do you take these findings and and sort of use them to create a strategy going forward? Sure. So we there are about seventeen key findings um, when you boil down the report. Mm -hmm. The sort of overarching um, findings. What will and some many of those are findings about what the strengths of the district are. I think the goal with those will be to maintain and expand those areas of strength, mm -hmm. and then. For the um, findings that have to do with areas of weakness, the ALT team will be involved with um, trying to go through a process of root cause analysis to figure out how things got to be the way they are. And the ALT team is the administrative leadership team, which is basically all the principals and senior, senior staff. That's right. Okay. And so, um, because even though this has taken a while to produce and um, I think includes a lot of good findings, mm -hmm. They're really all symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so you need to find out what are the layers below the symptoms that are driving what we see. Mm -hmm. And so then um, the outcome of that will be uh, hopefully a, a small group of issues that we think are really at the core of things that um, we need to address in order to move forward as a district. Mm -hmm. And then we'll um, be gathering representative groups across the district to develop a new district improvement plan. Okay. Um, so. What, when, what we'll want to do when we get down to core root causes is prioritize them in terms of their um, most important impact they could have on the district mm -hmm. and then to talk to people about strategies that we could deploy and tactics that we could implement to support the strategies across the district to um, bring us from where we are to where we'd like to be in three to five years. Excellent. And obviously this will also infuse you know, it'll inform decisions about curriculum. It'll inform your budgets. You mm -hmm. know, in the coming years, about where where we need to put emphasis, where we need to put more resources. I know you talk a little bit in the report about how resources have been allocated over time. And so, um, well, this is great. Um, I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to sit down and, and discuss it. Um, we're going to put a link to your findings at the end of the video so people can um, know where to find it if they haven't already had a chance to read it and, and, uh, and learn more about it. And, uh, and I just want to say, you know, thank you not only for, for, um, for being on the show, but also thank you for your work so far as superintendent. It's been a, a pleasure to work with you, and I think you mentioned stability, and I think one of the things that you have already brought to the district is a sense of stability, and I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, and I hope to do it for many more years. As do I, yes. Well, okay. thank you very much for uh, tuning into the Mayor's Report. As always, if you have any questions or suggestions for other topics that we could focus on in future episodes, you can email me at mayor at northamptonma.gov, or you can call my office at 587-1249. Thank you again for tuning into the Mayor's Report.